Hello everyone, and <clears throat> hello everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Ben Rue, Program Coordinator here of the Forum on Workplace Inclusion. I'm pleased to have you all here for today's webinar, Engaging Employees in an Inclusive Culture, What Leaders Can Do, with presenter Sarah Froning, Senior Consultant from Willis Towers Watson. We are pleased to, um, we are ple pleased to have more than 400 people registered for today's presentation, representing 40 states and, and five countries the US, Canada, UK, Australia, and Germany. <clears throat> We're very excited to have you, all, we have you all participating. This is the 10th and final webinar in our 2017 series sponsored by Aon. We hope you enjoy this experience, find the information helpful in your work, and that you will consider joining us for future webinars, one each month starting again in January 2018. Today, Sarah will present for about 50 minutes, taking questions at the end. Please use the chat feature to send send in your questions. And when you do do that, please make sure that you address it to all panelists and attendees, not just all panelists. Today's presentation is um, is SHRM CEU eligible. Also note that it is being recorded and will be posted to our website next week. For those who are on Twitter, use the hashtag hash, um, forum webinar to share your thoughts and follow along. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah uh, to go ahead and get us started. Sarah? Hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. Can everyone hear me okay? Ben, is that a good sound? Yep, you sound great. Excellent. Okay, so happy to be here today. Um, we have a lot of material to cover, um, and as Ben noted, I'll be really happy to take some questions at the end. I'm going to take you through um, three basic um, topics. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> just three goals basically for today's discussion. So um, the first is to kind of understand from the employee perspective how inclusion impacts performance via engagement and um, show how leaders are important in that equation. And so after we, after we do that, looking really from the perspective of the employee, we'll shift a little to look from the perspective of the institution um, to kind of try to reflect on our institutional maturity <clears throat> and the need to really begin where we are uh, on a roadmap. Um, and we'll finish up by looking at some practical tools for tackling inclusion and diversity in a holistic and integrated way. Um, so with that, I'll move straight into our first goal, um, inclusion and engagement and the impact on performance. Um, so when we undertook the study that this data comes from. Um, our goal was really to understand, to kind of get beyond the common sense link between inclusion and engagement. A lot of our clients were saying to us, well, we need to understand diversity and how it impacts our, how it impacts our organization. And we have a hunch that, you know, diversity is going to be important to our engagement equation. So we wanted to get some data to kind of figure out what that link actually looked like beyond some common sense assumptions. <clears throat> and so we took um, a slice of our global uh, normative database. Um, it was 27 global companies that comprised opinions from 350,000 employees. So globally, again, across the world. Um, <clears throat> and we were, um, this, this database had a consistent kind of um, employee opinion um, uh, data set in the sense that these companies were all asking the same types of questions about leadership, about inclusion and diversity, about uh, measuring engagement in the same way. Um, <clears throat> and so this, this snapshot that you see on this page is, is kind of the, the linkage that we found between inclusion, leadership, and engagement. And what this tells us is that um, Building an inclusive culture is one of the most impactful things that leaders can do to drive engagement. What that means is that when employees are favorable about items like this company supports diversity in the workplace, they're favorable about having equal opportunity and being accepting of differences, they're more likely to also rate their leaders in a more favorable way, um, you know, especially around these types of leadership items that we see here about leaders being interested in well-being, about acting with integrity, about respect, about values. And in turn, those positive perceptions about their leaders drive their um, willingness to go the extra mile, their willingness to 
give that discretionary effort and be sustainably engaged in a way that really impacts the organizational performance. Um, and, and the sustainable engagement that we're talking about here, it's kind of a specific way of looking at engagement. Um, we, we have found that employees who are not only willing to go the extra mile, but who are supported with tools and resources enabled and energized with a sense of social well-being tend to actually produce um, better results uh, in terms of the organizational performance. <clears throat> and so with this kind of um, ROI, if you will, of inclusion on the employee experience, it really puts leaders at the center. Um, this, the, the employees' views about how diversity and inclusion is supported in their workplace has a direct impact on how they view their leaders and how willing they are to kind of go the extra mile for the organization. Now, the one thing here that also to kind of emphasize is that it's not just um, any type of leadership that we're talking about here. We're talking about, again, a leadership that is kind of authentic and interested in the employee well-being and integrity. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble with the mouse here. <clears throat> Let's see if I use this. Yeah, here we go. Um, and so the next step is to kind of take this further. Uh, this, this presentation is really all about what leaders can do. And so we saw that leaders are central in, um, that perceptions of inclusion really are, are central to how leadership impacts engagement. This is another piece of that, of that data puzzle to show you from a different study, um, our global workforce study, um, just how important that leadership connection is to engagement. So, in, in these pie charts, what you're seeing is basically the percentage of people in this global workforce study. This is about 33,000 employees in a more recent study, um, again, global across different industries. And what it's telling you here is that when employees are favorable about their managers and their leaders, so their frontline supervisor and their executive leadership, they are 67% more likely to be highly engaged. So of that population, those who rated both managers and leaders high, uh, high were 67% were highly engaged. And that means that they were at the, the top range of that going the extra mile and getting that extra impact on the organizational performance. And you can see how the purple slice of the pie diminishes as uh, employees are rating their managers, um, you know, one effective, either you know, the senior manager or the frontline manager, or one or the other, or both ineffective, and how it goes down to 9% um, highly engaged or sustainably engaged. And so once again, it kind of drives that point home that <clears throat> it really is um, an exponential effect uh, that leadership uh, has on, on you know, the, the, the kind of um, willingness of employees to to give it their all for the organization. And so if, if inclusion is one of the most impactful things leaders can do to drive engagement, then that, that really is another reason for them to take that into consideration. And then at the bottom of the page are just some of the factors that we've found that kind of influence that um, ability of leaders to build inclusion just from their personal perspectives. Um, and we're gonna talk more about the institutional perspective in a minute, but this is just, you know, once you have the realization and this, that uh, the data that I've been driving home, that it really does um, start with the leadership. It starts with what are the behaviors that I, as a leader, need to adopt? And these are some of the basic ones that, of course, you probably already know. Um, you know, making sure that everyone has a voice, making it safe to speak up, um, em empowering the team and in, in finding solutions and making decisions, um, making sure that you listen to advice and feedback when it's given, and that you give feedback that is actionable back, um, and that you share credit for team success. These are all kind of well-known characteristics of inclusive leadership. Um, and, and so, again, that's, that's kind of one place to start. Now, beyond that, however, there are things that leaders can pay attention to in the organizational functioning um, in the work environment and emphasize to drive inclusion just beyond their own behaviors um, and their own kind of states of mind. Um, so back to our study of 27 companies and 350,000 
uh, employees, we looked at those in, that inclusion outcome that was that was such an impactful um, had such a great impact on leaders, and we looked at well, what drives perceptions on inclusion? What what makes it so that employees are favorable about this company supports diversity in the workplace? This company supports equal opportunity, and this work environment is respectful of differences. What is it that makes employees favorable about those things? Well, our study showed that when employees are favorable about their careers, about their relationships and their kind of communication environment or their ability to speak up, that drives also positive perceptions of inclusion. And so this, these, these things are, 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 are aspects of the culture, of any kind of organizational culture that can be emphasized and that have a really good chance of impacting how, um, how people in the organization are, are feeling. Uh, are, they, are they feeling that diversity is supported that equal opportunity is supported and that the workplace is, is respectful of differences. Um, and so those things are making sure that people have the, have, have the perception that they have a place to go in the organization, that they will benefit from the company's or the organization's attention to developing them as a person, as a, as a, a contributor. Um, and then the relationships, this, this, this perception that people get along and can cooperate, um, and the ability to speak up and be heard, and um, the, the confidence that the organization is listening. So regardless of where any organization is on the inclusion and diversity journey, and we'll talk about that journey in a minute, these are kind of basic cultural attributes that we found correlate with strong uh, positive perceptions of, of inclusion. Now, again, um, organizations are going to be at different points in the, in the journey towards inclusion, which we'll talk about in the next section. And <clears throat> our study of 27 companies gave us some insight into that as well. And so we were able to, um, we were able to look at how opinions kind of, um, varied in companies among the 27 companies those that had more or less diversity and higher or lower scores on inclusion now in this case by diversity it's a rather kind of restricted notion of diversity because we're talking about global companies and we're only talking about gender diversity here that is the ratio of men to women so it is very very limited um, because of the global nature of this data, we weren't able to look at other factors. Uh, not all of these companies code for things like sexual orientation or even, even race or ethnicity in the same ways in their employee surveys. So that's a caveat that's important to note. So this is really, our study was really more focused on gender diversity than other types of diversity. Nonetheless, um, the, the kind of findings that we found here around what uh, differentiates these different types of, of companies are still very, very insightful um, in the sense that um, the, the bottom piece shows us that effective talent management, so back to that career piece on the previous page, this is something that all organizations can pay attention to and will be very strongly, um, will strongly influence people's perceptions of inclusion. Um, you know, putting the right people in the right jobs um, uh, and making sure that people have a fair, clear and fair evaluation process is just, is just kind of the, the bread and butter of, of, of a lot of it. Um, and then on the other side, when you have um, maybe a diverse, uh, a comp uh, an organization that has more diversity but isn't um, so, so favorable about inclusion, focusing on that voice aspect is, is, a, is the, kind of the most bang for your buck. And then um, on the other flip side, um, maybe you have a uh, positive perceptions of inclusion, but, but one of the reasons is because there isn't a lot of diversity. Um, and so there isn't a lot of feelings of, um, you know, there's less, less kind of um, space for people to feel excluded if they're, um, or in the ones who are maybe not speaking up because they're such, such a small minority. And so in those cases, um, focusing on the um, community aspect and the, the um, not only the relationships of getting along well and working well together, cooperation and such, but also there's an aspect of um, interacting with the public as well. Okay, so 
we're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, uh, sorry. Um, one more note before we do that. Um, we, we also have um, some, some um, insights from another study we did last year called our Talent Management Rewards Study. And this is about, this study was asking employers, so um, organizations, how they were thinking about um, their kind of uh, workforce planning needs over the next few years. And what we found is that, you know, there's a lot of change coming. Um, there's a lot of kind of worry about, um, you know, the robots are coming to take our jobs. <laughs> um, the you know, automation, um, kind of new arrangements of, of workers coming in and out of organizations on, on crowdsourcing platforms and, and just um, different ways of getting work done. And this is, this is going to restructure organizations. And so the reason I bring it up before we kind of switch over to talking about things from, from a more um, institutional perspective um, and moving away from the employee perception is that there, you know, some of the things that I'm presenting to you today are kind of uh, the bread and butter of now, of where we are now, but things are going to change and um, very quickly. And so it's, I think it's, a, it's, it's an important thing to keep in mind that um, all of this is rather urgent in the sense that if we, if we can get the bread and butter right before things start to change too quickly and throw everything awry, um, we have a better chance, perhaps, of, of, of kind of getting the talent we need um, and getting our organizations kind of ready for what's to come. So um, getting, speaking of getting organizations ready, um, we're going to shift again away from the employee perspective about the employee experience and look, um, look at it from a kind of more um, clinical or pragmatic perspective. Um, now, Willis Towers Watson is a, is a human capital consultancy. So we help organizations manage people, manage risk, basically. And so, of course, you know, I come to you today with a, with a kind of model about how we see organizations. But it, gives, it puts everything I just described to you in terms of real data about employee experience into perspective and into a model that helps think through how to get stuff done in the organization. So we talked about um, the employee experience and the impact on business performance and the role of leaders. And you can see all of that in this model. Leaders are, and, and you can see the importance of leaders that, that we saw in the data in this model in the sense that leadership oversees it all. And, and the way that we think about inclusion and diversity in a model like that, like this, is that it's not, um, in our experience, for it to be effective, it can't be a kind of standalone um, practice within an organization or, or intervention, but rather has to permeate the whole system. Um, and that starts with leaders, with executive championship. And I think, you know, a lot of the sessions at the forum um, this past spring, um, I, I remember really focused on this idea that without the, the buy-in and the visible championing of inclusion and diversity as a part of the DNA of the organization, it is less effective. Um, and then in terms of the employee experience and how that impacts performance, um, we like to think about of it, it, a useful way to think about it is um, culture and strategy creating um, what we might call an employee value proposition or this is, this is the, the, that diamond in the middle is the employee experience that we were just talking about. But basically the culture has to support the strategy and in terms of inclusion and diversity, well, the culture is everything we just talked about, um, you know, in terms of uh, the way leaders interact, the way um, work gets done, um, the way that people kind of behave in the organization. Um, but then there's also the human capital strategy. And this is what we haven't really talked about, which is how to actually embed this into policies and programs, um, how to make sure that you are building a fair, equitable, diverse, and inclusive organization. Now. If you think so, this is just a way again to think about it all in one piece. Um, but then to think about where you are as an organization in, in building this, um, and this is this model that we put together here. Again, this, there are only two of these model slides, so um, just bear with me. Um, but it's a way of thinking about um, kind of where to begin where you are, because again, 
um, there's no point in kind of um, putting the cart before the horse if you as an organization are still kind of grappling with the basics of it um, you know back to that employee opinion piece you know there's there are things to focus on in a beginning stage that are different from where you are um, when you're at the cutting edge so this model shows kind of four stages the transforming phase at the end um, where IND is permeated in the goals support the strategy and you even have a kind of interface with the community where you're kind of well known and recognized as a leader in the space we haven't seen a lot of organizations reach this level to be quite honest um, a lot of the clients that we work with a lot of the organizations that we consult with um, are somewhere in between the yellow and the blue advancing and leading and a lot of times where where change kind of gets stuck is around that second to last bullet point under the leading um, circle around behavior change. Because how do you measure, um, how, how do you know when behavior has changed? Um, it goes back to the employee experience and making sure that you're, that you're listening to employees to, to um, you know, hear from them whether they think things have changed. But there has to also be kind of more concrete ways to, to measure that change and to, um, to account for it and, and make sure that it, that, that it sticks. So um, I won't spend much more time talking about, about this one, except that um, just to kind of reflect on, um, you know, how do you get from one phase to the other? Um, and, and another thing that I would maybe just throw out there is that, again, under the leading phase, when you get a, a lot of organizations struggle with how do we um, how do we account for differences and, and embrace and value difference? What is the role of it there? Um, and um, there there was a study done actually last year uh, on a specific type of organizations. It was law firms, um, but what they found was that sometimes, and it, and this also goes back to our study is that in a less diverse environment, calling out difference and, and account, account, kind of valuing it explicitly can be counterproductive for minority populations who may not want to um, sort of have the spotlight shown on them. And so there, there are other ways to kind of account for that and maybe putting the focus on something like equity rather than difference. So it's just a note to point out that, you know, when you when you start out with, making sure you're in your compliance phase, and then you move into kind of trying to um, get leaders to uh, be more involved, uh, to get the business case, and you kind of start moving through this phases. You know, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of kind of tripping points and they're gonna be different for every organization. And um, learning how to make sure that leaders are really, really, um, walking the walk or walking the talk um, and and you know these um, um, behaviors are changing and the ways that differences or equity are being are being kind of valued these are all very um, idiosyncratic for different organizations but it but it the ways that they're tackled are different but the but those are kind of the the key problems that organizations face so maybe if we have time at the end, people can talk about where they are as an organization, how they've confronted some of these, um, some of these these barriers in the maturity, in the maturity model. But for now, um, I'd like to get a little bit more practical as we move into the last section here, um, and talk about some tools that we've used that actually have been successful. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot uh, about different cultural attributes, shown you some complex models with different stages, um, but how do you actually do this in a systematic way? So we found that um, based on, you know, if you kind of break down that whole big model that I showed you about leadership and strategy and culture and outcomes, um, it really comes down to uh, these kind of three big buckets. Um, the first is diversity itself. Uh, who's in your organization? Um, what type of work are they doing? And, um, you know, is your workforce or, or is your organizational makeup what you need it to be? Um, 
in terms of the changing landscape of work that I mentioned, in terms of the communities that you work in, the customers you serve, et cetera. That's the first piece. Um, the second piece is once they're there, are they being paid equ equitably? And the pay part is really important and it's kind of on its own um, for many different kind of administrative reasons, like legal reasons that, you know, this kind of work always should be done under attorney client privilege um, and should be kind of done in a very precise way. Um, so that's an important thing to note in and of itself. And then the inclusion piece, and, and that kind of goes back to listening to your employees um, and understanding their experience. So how does that break down in a practical way when it comes to, um, you know, actually building a program and thinking about what leaders can implement in the organization? So if you take those three buckets and you look at key drill downs or points in the talent management process, um, in the process by, you know, which you're dealing with your employees, um, it comes down to a series of questions. Uh, the diversity piece um, is looking at the, the market versus the hires. Um, so, you know, in, in some industries, like um, I work with um, utility and construction industry companies, for example, who are, you know, historically very white male. Um, there's just kind of a single demographic and that reality is changing and they need um, to understand how to diversify their pipeline. That's a very specific kind of, um, um, you know, type of work that you have to, uh, or goal, I should say, that is, is part of an organizational strategy. Um, and then you can kind of get more um, beyond that, looking at not just the entire talent market, but who are the critical roles in your organization. So this is very, you know, kind of strategic workforce planning. But beyond the basic strategic workforce planning, just looking at, looking at, looking at it from a diversity perspective and um, looking at who gets put in what roles. Um, do we pay them fairly, um, et cetera. And, and then you can even um, increase that kind of um, granularity by looking at um, diversity categories across performance brackets. How do they progress up the grades? Um, how do um, different groups experience their tenure? Um, and so each point in the, in the kind of life cycle of a, of a person in the organization, um, there are questions to ask about diversity, about pay equity, and about inclusion. Um, so these are a lot of questions to ask. What ends up happening when you start asking these questions is you need data. You need data to answer the questions, and you end up um, kind of on a fact-finding mission within the organization to pull out these numbers and these, these, these um, statistics so that you can kind of have a dashboard to understand what your organization look, looks like. Um, and, you know, some of that's going to be easier to do than, than other um, data points. Some of it you can be transparent about some of it you can't with with the, you know the entirety of your organization um so you know a lot of times you can't tackle all of this at once um but you have to start somewhere and so you kind of look at um based on the complexity of your workforce and what you're dealing with at the moment where, where um you know how much you can bite off at, at one at one time um Here's some examples of actual things that, that organizations implemented after looking at the answers to those questions on the previous page. Um, and so uh, there, there are different, you know, back to the question what leaders can do, but all the way at the bottom there, establishing accountability measures for leaders around all of these outcomes um, is going to be key. Um, so I think that that is going to be um, one of the key takeaways of this of this presentation is that you know back to what I said at the beginning it starts with your own behaviors as leaders um, and how you interact with people but it also speaks to kind of the, the responsibility of leaders to implement a whole system approach and to make sure that 
all aspects are covered, um, like all the things that you see on this page. Um, so, uh, you know, I could, I could kind of go through each of them, and I'm sure there are some that are kind of more relevant uh, to some organizations than others. Um, you know, the career succession and planning one in the, in the middle there uh, is important, again, back to our employee experience. We, we, we remember from that, from that section that this is kind of the, um, you know, talent management and career progression are things that are going to impact inclusion kind of in every, wherever you are as an, as an organization on the path towards maturity. Um, so I would always kind of shine, shine the light on that one um, because it kind of is, is a baseline that underlies a, a lot of it. Now, a um, couple more slides until we get to our, our discussion. Um, th this, is, this is a very uh, um, kind of well-known change management approach. Um, and the reason it's here is because um, a lot of what we've been talking about is really kind of um, deep organizational work in the sense that you're trying to change the culture. You're trying to build something and change the culture. And so, uh, you know, change management principles are, are, may seem generic, but, but they're not because they're really, really important to this work. Um, and so um, when you're thinking about change management, kind of on the left-hand side is the more generic piece that applies to kind of all organizations. Um, and, and, and then on the right-hand side, here are some ways that that impacts inclusion and diversity work. And the top one, of course, is the leadership accountability for performance. And so this goes right back to what we were saying about our own behaviors as leaders. Um, but then the next bullet point is the executive sponsorship for the programs and events, and all the things that we've been talking about um, kind of in the second and third parts of this presentation. Um, and so it starts, again, starts and ends kind of with leaders. But these are, um, beyond just that, these are some of the things that um, we found um, will have an impact. So it um, starts with leaders. Then, it, then you have to impact or, or implement, rather, some form of measuring progress. And we found that um, key performance metrics, such as that dashboard that I described, kind of a dashboard that will, that will encapsulate some of the answers to those questions on that page about what, what employees you have, where people are in your organization, um, listening to the employee experience through surveys, um, through focus groups, through however you can. Um, having a communication strategy around your culture, um, whether you call out inclusion and diversity explicitly or not, isn't, isn't as important as having a communication strategy around your culture that is inclusive. Um, uh, the importance of storytelling, and I didn't really talk about this very much, but this is something um, that can be used to really um, Kind of foster that sense of community and voice that I was that I was referring to in the employee opinion piece, um, and also um, if there are events and programs that are that are being implemented, making sure that leaders are in front of those, um, and then involving. Um, we there was a lot of discussion around this at the forum in, in the spring around um, kind of the importance of having councils having resource groups, having events, and also some frustration with um, organizations feeling like maybe they're stuck in the party planning phase of inclusion and diversity. And so um, involving is great, involving is necessary, employee resource groups are, are necessary, um, but there should be also, um, I, I kind of like in this model that measuring is second and, and that involving is fourth, because you want to make, if you don't measure, then, then kind of the involving can kind of um, backfire in a sense. Um, the next one around learning, I think this one is really important. And if I were to take away every other slide in this presentation and focus only on this bullet point, I may have had even, uh, uh, you know, just as, just as great an impact on you as leaders. Facing your own unconscious bias um, and making a commitment to 
to lifelong learning in that regard, I, I don't think I could emphasize enough how important that is. Um, it, it's, it, and I don't really want, it, that's why there's only one bullet point, because we could either, you know, talk about that for probably uh, an entire presentation, but I, I do want to just, you know, pause for that one moment to say how important that is. And then in the, in the final instance, um, the sustaining piece of change management. So this is where that behavior change piece, um, this is how you move the needle and you get from, you get from, you know, one slice on the maturity model to the, to the final slice um, by, by really making sure that you have a way to track behavior change. Um, and that is really embedding all of these principles and all of these practices within your entire talent management program. And so it means kind of getting everyone on board and not just having, perhaps not just having, you know, one or two people who are kind of charged with inclusion and diversity, but having it be um, integrated into everything that, that HR is doing, um, everything that the organization is doing in terms of managing its people. And so with that, um, what can leaders do? Um, so these are just some kind of um, um, phrases to sum up everything that we've talked about. And there are some links to videos in here which we don't have time to watch at this point. Um, but um, they will be kind of available if you want to download these materials and click on them. And I'll kind of describe them for you as we wrap up. So what can leaders do? Visibly champion gender equity as a top priority for the organization. And it says gender equity, but it should say, it could say equity for all. Um, it could say inclusion and diversity. Um, gender equity is there because our study was on, on gender diversity, but again, it, it could be a more general statement as well. Some examples are paradigm for parity, boardroom. Um, there are some yeah, um, well-known, um, organizations out there that are kind of providing roadmaps for organizations to um, make gender equity and other forms of equity a priority in their organization. Um, Paradigm for Parity is actually one that Willis Towers Watson, our CEO, signed on to. And, um, you know, uh, our, our organization is, is implementing the five points of that plan. Um, and one of them, the kind of the baseline of it is unconscious bias training you know, just for your information. And that is starting to be rolled out across our organization. The second thing is to, and this one's tough, is to go beyond the quota mentality. So that's kind of the bottom of the maturity model where you're worrying about compliance. And be willing to evaluate meritocratic practices for inherent bias. I think this is really hard for a lot of organizations. They want to believe that they have a fair system. Um, but when they start answering all those questions that were on that diagnostic page, they start to realize that maybe things aren't as fair as they thought. And that can be tricky in terms of opening yourself up to liability um, and, you know, finding ways to fix the problem and communicate about the problems. Um, being the change you want to see, this goes back to that super important bullet point on the last page, being willing to confront this unconscious bias that you have within yourself and even maybe conscious biases that you know you have. Um, the video that's attached to this one is, um, I believe it was the AT&T CEO, um, talking about his employee resources groups, his employee resource group, sorry, and um, uh, the fact that one of, his, one of his, he's a white man and one of his closest friends is a black man, and when he heard his friends um, kind of, you know, very honest account of living as a black person in the United States, how shocked he was. And, and it's related to Black Lives Matter and, and to being, you know, willing to understand just how much we as white people don't know about the black experience here in America. Um, and to be okay with how uncomfortable that is and how necessary it is. Um, commit to an inclusion diversity strategy. So as a leader, you saw you saw in, the, in, our, in our models and in our data how important it is for leaders to commit um, and to answer those questions on that diagnostic page and to be kind of transparent about the data. 
the video that is linked to this one is from a CEO of a company called GoDaddy, which you may be familiar with, who were inherent, uh, uh, notoriously sexist in the way that they did business in, the, in their ads. And the CEO kind of turned things around at one point recently. Um, there's a New York Times article about it that's really, really interesting. But this video is shown, uh, to, he's reacting to the election last year, but he's saying that to move the needle on sexism, um, he advocated for the data. So those questions about you know who's in your organization, where they are, that I showed you on that page, he put the answers up in public and he showed everyone. And, and that was the way that they started moving the needle and they really changed the culture um, and the leadership structure in that company. Um, commit to embedding IND into the culture. So this speaks to everything that we've been talking about, um, employee opinions um, and, and you know, building a whole system approach, um, the change management piece. Um, and, and this video, um, I think it's a panel of women and they're talking about how important it is to, um, and, and also kind of speaks to the, the AT&T one as well, is how important it is for people to hear other people's perspectives. Um, and also how important it is for, um, for people to amplify each other's voices. Um, for example, for women to amplify each other's ideas when they're not, when they're being talked over or not heard, or for, um, you know, for people of color to amplify each other's voices to make sure that they are being heard. Um, and then the last thing is to promote a diverse workforce uh, and inclusive culture. And uh, it's around building a shared purpose and an empowerment among the workforce. Um, and this one is, I believe it's the, um, uh, the CEO of a healthcare company, and he's talking about He's a black man and he's talking about um, not always looking at the people around you who are like you, but rather um, broadening your horizons as a leader and looking around your, your close circle and thinking, well, are you only, are, are you only taking you know, advice on important core issues from people who look like you? And uh, the importance of opening yourself up to different perspectives in your immediate circle. And with that, um, wrapping up these kind of basic principles that have summed up what we've been talking about, I think we are at our time for opening up to questions. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that. Like, and. Um, at this time, we will open up for questions. As I said previously, please go ahead and type your, any questions you have into the, um, into the chat fe feature. And when you are doing that, please make sure that you have selected all panelists and all and attendees so that everyone can see your questions. Um, we do have a question that was sent uh, a little earlier, uh, just asking, Sarah, would you provide us with some recommended powerful short video clips that can introduce us D and I, or introduce yeah, introduce us to D and I and unconscious bias in on YouTube, et cetera. Perfect, because these videos actually, this page will be really great for that. Um, uh, unless you were talking about, unless it was a question about um, something more specific, like what is unconscious bias? That yeah, yeah I could. Uh, no, it looks like they were just looking for suggestions for videos that can be that can introduce introduce us to DNI and unconscious bias. Um, and I know you have some videos in your show that in the slide show that you were able to show. Um, but we will be posting the webinar or posting the recording of the webinar as well as the slideshow itself onto onto the website. Uh, within the next week, but if you have any other suggestions on resources, it sounds like they would also be interested in that. Sure, yeah. Um, there definitely is a lot. Um, um, gosh, I almost don't know where to start, but maybe I could maybe I could create a short list and post it with the slides. Yeah, I mean, if you want to do that, I, like I said, we'd be more than happy to post anything that you would like to share onto the website after this. Okay, 
Yeah, I'll take, I'll, let me do that because I, yeah, there, there's a lot of material up. Okay, wonderful. Um, so, and the next question is, can you explain more about, more about focus on equity versus difference? Right, so that's a great question. So I was, I was referring to a study, I think it was published in the Harvard, Bus Harvard Business Review last year. They did a whole kind of compilation of uh, diversity inclusion studies. And this one was on law firms. And it, it was looking at how different types of diversity programs affected turnover and what they found was that programs that focused on valuing difference um, tended to not work so well for minorities uh, for people of color because they were more minorities in these organizations and again they felt uncomfortable with anything that was kind of um, and they didn't give examples of the specific programs but um, you know, these would be things like employee resource groups um, uh, that were, I guess that's a really good example of a program that, that values difference because employee resource groups are there to kind of showcase, um, not showcase, but, but um, provide a resource for a particular demographic rather than a focus on equity. And I'm not saying that one is bad or, or good, or that employee resource groups are bad. It's just they're, they're kind of different philosophies. The focus on equity would be to, to not so much call out difference, but rather to focus on um, making sure that everyone had equal opportunity to achieve the same kind of rewards and, and career paths. Um, so it might not, so it might be within the organization that might be uh, focusing more on things like um, gender neutral job descriptions rather than um, you know a, a women's resource group so that's just an example I hope that helps wonderful um, can you recommend resources or toolkits uh, for inclusive leadership that can be help leaders adopt such behaviors so here's where it gets tricky toolkits um, you know, and, and this is kind of the point that we're trying to drive home is that it's never kind of a one and done intervention. And um, I think one of the things that we're realizing is that the importance of leadership is so key that it has to start with a commitment and then it has to start with building a very kind of specific institutional plan for how leaders will continue to you know, make sure there are programs and policies and culture change in place. Um, so I guess the, the, um, the bad news is that I don't have a ready-made toolkit for that. Um, I know that there are a lot of organizations out there. There are a lot of kind of um, smaller firms that provide leadership coaching and development um, and, I, you know, unconscious bias training. There are some great providers out there, and I, I would highly recommend that any kind of any program start with leaders um, undertaking unconscious bias training on themselves. Um, however, I would say that the best toolkit is um, is to sit down as a leadership team and and decide what your goals are and what you want to accomplish, and then from then from from that point you kind of know what tools and skills you need, and you can go um, take them from different providers. Um, you know, or, or sources that are out there. So I'm sorry I don't have a better kind of packaged response, but I think the, I think the response is more complex than just one toolkit. Okay. And how ready are leaders to engage in this systematic approach, systemic approach? That's a great question. I think it really depends. Um, I've seen all kind of, kind of, places on the spectrum. I've seen leaders that are incredibly committed and that can push real change in, in short periods of time. Um, and then I've seen organizations, uh, you know, kind of come to us for help. Uh, we need to do this program or that program, but they don't have, but their leadership isn't bought in and, and, and how, how kind of frustrating that can be to make things go forward in such an environment. Um, 
I think it varies by industry. I think, and I think it's driven by the urgency of the talent needs, to be honest. Um, in industries where, uh, and you know, by industry, I'm also including nonprofits and just kind of all, you know, aspects of organizational life. It's, it's areas where, where, where it, like for example, the construction industry where, where employers actually really need people and can't get them, that they start to say, oh wait, maybe we have a diversity problem or maybe we need to think about this in a more systemic way. Um, so unfortunately, that's not a very kind of, um, you know, unfortunately it is what it is that it's when, it's when organizations really are faced with a need um, that they start to get, to get serious and systemic about it or systematic about it rather. Okay, um, and what you are seeing how organizations are ensuring that their performance management, career, and succession planning processes are culturally relevant to engage employees of diverse backgrounds. I think it's supposed to be what are you seeing? How? Right, so I would go back to this. It's one step at a time. Um, and it's, and it's based on, again, who you are as an organization and what you're trying to accomplish um, and, and, and where you are. Um, and it starts with answering the questions of, you know, that first one, who do we have in our organization? Do, who do we hire? How, how do we pay them? And are we, inclus are we including them? Because, you know, a lot of companies will, or organizations will start by saying, well, we just need to hire more diverse people, but, and they can do all the hiring of diverse people they want, but if they can't create a culture that's going to keep them and engage them. Um, so I guess I'm repeating the question that you're asking by, by saying, you know, it's, it's, it's one question at a time, one segment at a time, and um, always with your overall organizational strategy in mind. Okay. Um, could you state the number of colleagues included in the study? Again, you mentioned 27 companies. How many employees? 350,000. Ooh, wow. Okay. Yeah. It was a pretty good database. I mean, that's why we're very confident those insights are, are um, you know, generalizable. Okay. Um, can you speak a little more about the importance of not only meeting people where they are, but stressing that they cannot stay there? So often leaders are reluctant to make the, the employees and often managers and leaders uncomfortable about bias. So they talk, but no change actually happens. Wow. That is such a tough one. Um, and it, it kind of sums up everything in a way because you know, everything that we've been talking about today is just driving home the fact that we cannot, we have to, the leaders have to lead. There's no way around it. They are so important. Without them, an organization isn't going to make it. And so if you have a leader, and, and I've seen this, um, and this kind of attitude, well, well, everything's fine and, and nothing needs to change and, and I'm fine. Um, Honestly, that's a tough nut to crack because it, it kind of boils down to one person's inability to be the change that they want to see or to confront their own unconscious bias. That's why I emphasize that bullet point so much. Uh, this one here, um, learning, this learning one in the change management. I think that's what we're talking about. And, um, you know, I think that when it comes down to, if, if it is just dealing with one or two or a few in, people who are in this phase where they can't, they can't get through this learning phase, um, you really have to evaluate what to do in that situation. Um, and I can't obviously answer it for each situation, but it's, it, since it comes, it's coming down to the individual, you have to almost confront the individual. Okay, and how many companies slash organizations have reached that transformative space? Very few. Um, I don't know that I've worked with, with any, to be honest. I think there are some that have a few of those characteristics. I mean, there are obviously companies that get recognized and get prizes. Willis Towers Watson uh, itself earned a perfect score on the 
human rights, um, uh, the human rights campaign um, index, for example. Uh, so we do things right. We don't do everything right all the time. Um, and I think that that last question, the one before about, um, you know, how do you get past this kind of unwillingness to learn is really where, um, where, where change stalls. And again, it, it, sometimes it, it, it comes down to very personal one-on-one -on -one interactions that can get pretty, pretty deep, you know, and, but that's the, that it, sometimes it comes down to that. Well, great. Um, in particular, how can we encourage straight white male leaders to feel part of I and D efforts that they have a role to play and stand to benefit? Well, I think that's a great question, and I think that it, it's you know a lot of the leaders that we're talking about are straight white males, and showing them this data that that kind of drives home you know how important their leadership is to everyone's engagement, how important their leadership is to everyone feeling included, um, that it really is incumbent on them to lead by example. I think that, that there, I mean, there's no greater way to be involved, in my opinion, um, than to take responsibility for the, for the kind of, for the culture and for um, creating the organization and, and that you want and, and, and leading and walking the talk. Um, so I think what it, it's, it actually comes back to this change management model um, involving um, um, a lot of times in some of the kind of nitty gritty client work that we've done, it comes down to um, helping leaders stay involved in, in some of the events and programs that are happening with an organization, just visibly champion things um, in, in a very kind of deliberate way. Great. Um, as um, next question, as a woman who works with ninety six percent men, I feel like the power imbalance prohibits me from bringing these ideas forward. If I attempt to introduce these ideas, I feel like it perpetuates the gender stereotypes and could negatively impact women instead of opening uh, up to being explored. How best can I begin to influence this change in these circumstances? Well, that's a great question, and what an amazing challenge. Um, data. Um, data is always going to help. I, you know, not that I think that you need it, because I already believe you, but, but, it, but it, when you're talking about, you know, how do you, how do you kind of avoid being thrown into a stereotype, trap of a stereotype, the way to do that is, is, is to present the facts. Um, so it goes back to these questions. If you can get get your hands on the answers to some of these questions, that will help. Now, sometimes though, just opening the gates to get the answers to this these questions require you to make the business case um, that it's necessary. And in that case, the facts that you need could be going back to the first part of our presentation around the employee experience. Um, I don't know how big your organization is, but if there's a way to, um, or maybe you already do a survey, or maybe you have some data that you could that could help you uh, show leaders that that the employee experience is a problem because of you know the lack of diversity, then that could also help. Another thing I would point to is the communicating on this change management um, piece here. Storytelling. I, I had a one client um, where they had very kind of reticent leadership. Leaders didn't want to believe that the women in the organization were experiencing what they said they were experiencing. But when they organized some very powerful storytelling events, the minds were changed. Um, so again, data in the form of statistics, a workforce statistics or in the form of first person storytelling can be powerful. Great, thank you for that. Um, next question, how can executive committees drive inclusion initiatives and fostering opening open communication without fear, intimidation or 
uh, for our non-executives. And before I answer this, Sarah, I just want to um, uh, point out that it is now two o'clock, and we uh, do still have quite a few questions. Um, so we we're happy to go ahead and continue to answer the questions. I just want to be sure. respectful of our time and let everyone know that it is now two o'clock. But yeah, so how can we go ahead? Um, yeah, how can executive committees drive inclusion initiatives and fostering open communication without fear and or intimidation for non-executives? So I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Um, how can executives foster inclusion and communication without fear uh, for non-executives? So I don't How quite can understand. executive committees, executive committees drive inclusion initiatives and fostering open communication without fear slash intimidation for non-executives? So, so I guess if I understand, it's about how can the executive committee kind of impose this on others? Is that? Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. I wonder if they have, if they're I'm clarified. trying to understand the yes, that, yes, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. That's according to the person who asked the question, that's correct. Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, maybe not every organization can have the luxury of doing this, but, you know, in terms of organizational culture, it's not like civil society. The organizational culture has to fit the strategy that the organization is trying to accomplish. And if, and if inclusion and diversity is part of that strategy, which we're arguing in this, in this whole webinar that it should be, and, and you're, you know, you're pushing that from the top down into the organization and you're getting resistance, maybe those, whoever is providing resistance may not be a good fit for the organization. I mean, that's the clear, that's the simple answer. It may not be, the most convenient answer in ma in many cases, but um, you know if if you're getting if you're getting you know fear um, or even pushback, kind of um, uh, I don't want to say violent pushback, but um, you know vehement pushback, then I would say that's a red flag that there are aspects of there are, there are um, people in the organization who are going to resist this type of culture change and they may not be right for the new organization um now if it's just a matter of if it's not if it's not kind of that polarized and it's a matter of kind of changing people's minds um i think all the all the pieces of this change management model are very applicable and i also think you have to take it one step at a time and um you know, tackle, bite off what you can chew organizationally, and, um, you know, just be very kind of transparent in your communications about what you're doing and why it is part of the organizational strategy. And always focus it on that, the organizational strategy. If you always make it about that, then it can never be about, you know, identity politics or some, or some other things that make people angry. Um, just always make it about what we're trying to do as an organization. Oh, great. Um, so the next question is, you've talked about the ROI and employee engagement. wonder if there is a lot of data around the ROI on business results, companies that are diverse and or drive an inclusive culture. There is actually. Um, well, and we focused it on engagement because we have the data that, that shows the correlation for sustainable engagement on business performance. So from our perspective, the correlation, that's just another data point to, to prove that um, inclusion impact, impacts the bottom line. That doesn't speak to whether diversity impacts the bottom line. And there are studies out there. McKinsey has done one. Um, Credit Suisse has done one. I think there, there are a bunch um, out there. And if I can actually add that to my list of references to send the videos, um, because I, I have some citations I can provide um, that, that show the impact on 
um, you know, revenue, like actually, you know, hard business um, outcomes of gender diversity and race, racial diversity. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, uh, next question is, how do you measure behavior changes regarding measuring behavior change, regarding, me regarding measuring behavior changes, what types of behaviors are commonly measured? Is it focused uh, around employee engaged? Is it focused around employee engagement? Right, so um, that that's a great question. How do you measure behavior change? It's kind of like the Uber question. Every organization is gonna do it differently. So a lot of organizations, let me go back here. Um, a lot of organizations will, um, you know, have specific performance goals for leaders um, around inclusion and diversity, and that might it might be around um, teamwork, it might be around mentorship, uh, or even for more executive level leaders, there might be a goal in your performance management, you know, tool or process uh, that requires you to. Um, you know, interact with people who are different from you, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, about broadening your horizons as a leader. Well, some companies will build in some type of specific metric around, around that, like, you know, you have to participate on a council or you have to, it kind of depends on the organization and what kind of roles they have, but the idea is to get leaders to do things that are out of their normal range of activities and with different types of people. Um, trying to think of other examples um, for this performance management piece here on this list you know um, and this again depends on the type of organization if you can have this feasibly speaking is to to think about how you um, how you evaluate people and is it based on FaceTime or is it based on um, you know other types of metrics um, like sales or even billable hours or um, you know output or different types of things that can be measured um, and that allow people to have more flexibility for example in the way that they run their work schedules so those are some examples Wow, thank you um, can you speak to spreading inclusive practices to populations where compliance is not the um, foundational imperative for example transgender or LG LGBTQ population. Um, yeah, that I think is really important. It's crucial because those those statuses aren't always protected by law, and so aren't always um, covered in the compliance part of the maturity model. Um, you know, I would say there. I would actually go back to this slide. Um, in in maybe this voice um, part here, um, in 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 companies that may be diverse but less but less inclusive. So this would maybe fit that case. A company where you had some diversity that may not even be visible. Maybe people aren't out or they aren't completely being themselves. I don't know. I'm just kind of imagining that could be the case. And in this type of situation, building a culture where people have the ability to speak up, where people feel just in general about anything, um, the ability to kind of communicate with each other is going to help that. Um, and then when you start, you know, paying more attention to programs and policies um, and say you do a survey and you ask people to identify, maybe they'll feel comfortable identifying. And that's a, that's a really good first step actually right there is, um, if you are doing some kind of employee listening exercise, that if people are, are feeling uh, safe enough to speak up and say who they are, um, you've, already, you've already won the first battle. Great. Um, and uh, does the term vulnerable talent segments refer specifically to diverse or underrepresented populations, or what is, is meant by that? Um, vulnerable talent segments. I'm trying to remember where I saw where where I included that phrasing exactly. Um, 
I would imagine that I was referring to not diverse populations per se, but rather um, talent that either is either at risk because um, there, there's a kind of lack of it in that industry or is at risk for leaving the organization because they're disengaged. But maybe I got the context wrong. So if you remember which slide it was on, I can go back. Let's see, the, uh, let's, uh, this came from the attendee C005455. So if you are still here, um, it's a header in one of the slides. Hmm, I didn't see it. Maybe it's this one. Slide 13? Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, right there. IND outcomes for vulnerable talent segments. Of course, right in front of my face. Okay. Yeah, so in this case, we are talking about um, we are talking about diversity categories per se. So I take it back. We're absolutely talking about that because it's, um, we're focusing on diversity categories like gender, like race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, veteran status. Um, and um, what a, any other characteristic um, that might be kind of uh, relevant to your organization. So for example, at Willis Towers Watson, we have a whole program around hiring people with certain forms of autism to do certain types of data work. That's just one example. So that would be an example of a vulnerable talent segment. Okay, um, great. And it looks like this is, um, got a couple more. On slide 10, there was a mention that diversity programs would be driven by HR, but what if you have a small two-person HR team? Are there other ways to drive initiative? Yeah, and that's why that's in the compliance stage because it's not ideal for, for diversity programs to be driven only by HR. What's meant by that bullet point is that at that beginning stage, that's often the case. That's often kind of what you're stuck with or what you have to start with. So um so that can be a real challenge if it's just one or two people um i would recommend in that case um getting the whole leadership team involved as as a kind of committee um so enlisting them to be your sponsors and to and to kind of um letting them know that you need to work in tandem with them and you need you need their strategic guidance and so enlisting them again as a kind of committee um to work with you in, in everything that you do is, is what I would recommend somehow making that connection and getting their involvement. Great. And it looks like this is going to have to be our, our last one. If we, if there, if your question wasn't answered, we will be sharing Sarah's contact information so you could um, re directly reach her, but, um, and ask her, but, uh, and again, this all, her slideshow as well as well as recording of this webinar will be posted and also her um, resource list. So the last question is going to be celebrating differences um, uh, celebrating differences beyond the cultural festivals of the 90s, 2000s. Yeah. What does this look like today? How is this notion evolving? Wow, that's such a great question. I love that question. Um, and it's so... It, it, it's, I don't have a good answer, I'll be honest. Um, I think I almost, a lot of me it, it feels that we're kind of stuck in that era in a lot of ways because a lot of the organizations that I've worked with have employee resource groups that kind of behave in that, in that kind of mindset. Um, it's hard to get past the event planning stage of, of diversity work in organizations. It really is. Um, and so valuing difference, um, there are some things, I mean, one of the things that, that I've seen is, is 
looking at different ways to measure leadership success or different ways to measure success in any role, really. Um, and kind of goes back to those different performance metrics, less about face time, more about output, um, or, or maybe building in, um, uh, building in uh, accountability for things like collaboration, um, whereas that was never really, you know, that hasn't really been, you know, done before. So valuing difference in performance metrics, um, accounting for different ways of achieving the same goal, to me, is more outcome focused and more impactful than, you know, having, you know, a food festival where everyone brings a dish from their native country or from their hometown or, you know, um, you know, because I feel like those types of events, well, I don't think there's, I think there is a really important aspect of those events is getting people to socialize with each other and, and, and sort of get to know one another and understand maybe different aspects of people's identities. I do think that's important. It's really important, but I think maybe there are, um, without that outcome focus piece, which I think has been sorely neglected, it, it kind of, you know, it doesn't really get you where you're going. I mean, there was another study in that Harvard Business Review our, uh, issue um, where they studied, they studied 800 diversity and inclusion programs over 30 years, and they found that the, the kind of stuff that you're, that 90s, you know, cultural identity stuff, it's not, it didn't move the needle. It just frankly didn't work. So again, I, I, I'm not saying it's not important, but I, it's, it's, it's maybe a, um, it's an insufficient condition for, for true culture change. And I think the outcome-based metrics are more important. But they're harder to pin and harder to identify. Uh, great, thank you so much. So I just wanna head and I shared Sarah's email for all, of, for anyone who had any questions that we didn't, unfortunately couldn't get to today. But we will also, like I said, I will also be sharing this recording of this webinar, and we'll also be posting the um, the slideshow itself and Sarah's list of resources uh, within the next week. And I will be sending I will be sending out an email to you all when when those are available on our website. But I just want to go ahead and thank you, Sarah, so much, and thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. And a big thank you again to our webinar sponsor, Aon. The next forum webinar, um, which will be the first of our 2018 series, will be held on January 19th. Uh, our presenter will be Sarah Warbelow War War um, will speak. Uh, um, she is the legal director from the Human Rights Campaign. Her webinar is entitled The LGBTQ Legal Landscape. And don't forget to put into your calendars the 2018 and 30th Annual Forum Conference, April 10th through 12th, here in Minneapolis. The theme is Power the Future. Uh, we look forward, to, uh, look for key keynote announcements and the opening of registration in early January 2018. Again, thank you. Thanks for your participation in today's webinar, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you.